presence guide us and uh, guide the camera people as well. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Hello and welcome to Ignite with Mwangala with me, Mwangala Chakalashi Santos. Now remember, this is a show where we bring you real people with real stories meant to leave a lasting and positive impact on your lives. Today, once more, we go all the way to Dr. Neva Sequila Mumba, who opened his home to us, to have a chat with him and get to know him a little better. Dr. Sequila is the eighth vice president for this country and is the president of the multi-party democracy, the MMD. Dr. Sequila, thank you for inviting us to your home. Thank you so much, Mwangala. It's an honor to have you this morning. And what a wonderful way to start the day with uh, such an uh, interesting crew. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I must say you have a beautiful place. Well, thank you. Thank you. All the credit goes to my wife. Wow. She does all the garden work, you know. Thank you so thank much. You. And by the way, we are in the COVID-19 pandemic that has hit uh, us globally, but you still opened your home to us. We're saying thank you so much. Well, I just made sure you were all COVID free. So oh, yes. <laughs> that's all I need to do. Uh, thank you so much. Yeah. Now, Doctor, it has been a norm for most successful people like you. You know, their story is always I started from a, a humble background. Is that a similar story for you? Yeah, I think that uh, my generation um, of Zambians or people. Um, it doesn't matter how successful they have become. Mm. Uh, their story will basically take you back to humble beginnings. Yeah. Uh, because uh, most of us grew up uh, during a time when opportunities were very rare. So we have now grown up during the time when things have improved. Um, people are able to get um, you know, more than our parents used to have. So yes, I have a very humble beginning. Um, Maybe too humble. <laughs> <laughs> Let's hear it. <laughs> well, uh, I, uh, my family comes from uh, Northern Province, uh, to be more specific, Chinsali, which is now in what we call Muchinga Province. Mm. Um, my father was um, um, an educationist. He started off as a jeans teacher, which today would be interpreted as um, manager of schools, you know, going through schools, and inspector of schools. Mm. Um, my mother was a housewife, um, both of them in Chinsali. I come from a family of 12. I'm the 11th born. Oh. And so uh, you can imagine that the growing up was the survival of the fittest. Mm. Uh, if you're the 11th, you've got to make sure you, you, know, you create a path for your survival. Yeah. But uh, obviously my parents were very loving. They were Christian. My father was a lay preacher. My mother uh, was a very strong um, uh, uh, KBBK in the United Church of Zambia. Um, she was the treasurer for the Chinsali um, congregation. Um, and yes, and because of my background as UCZ, I was actually uh, baptized by the renowned Paul Bushindo, uh, who was um, one of the most amazing uh, UCZ uh, ministers. Uh, he used to wear very smart suits, um, but he never wore shoes. So he really had a, a history of, um, um, you know, doing new things. So I, I carry that legacy and honor because that name Mushindo in the UCZ church is as Mushindo as, mm. as it sounds holy. Mm. So um, that's a great history. So, yeah, but um, I was born... Although my family was in Chinsali, that's where we were best. Uh, at the time that I was born, um, we were temporary in, an, uh, in Central Province. Mm -hmm. um, I was born at Chitambo Mission Hospital, um, uh, just about 100 years after the death of uh, David Livingstone, yeah. um, almost to the month. Uh, the same place where David Livingstone died, that's why I was born uh, at Chitambo Mission. And then I went back to Chinsali, of course, and grew up there. Went to school at Moaba Primary School um, in Chinsali up to grade, uh, grade 7. Mm. Uh, then I didn't make it for Form 1. Uh, so my father took me to Chinsali Primary School to repeat my grade 7. Mm -hmm. So I repeated my grade 7. And um, as though in revenge, I, I shot from Chinsali to Hillcrest. Wow. Um, 
But before I get to Hillcrest, I, I just want to explain the fact that um, my life was very normal, like any African child. Yeah. Uh, although my father was a district secretary in Chinsali oh. at the end of the day, as we were growing up, um, we grew up in our village in Lubwa, in the Lubwa area. Oh. Um, the area is called Impiana Bualia, which is really next to uh, Lubwa Mission. And uh, most of our activities were going into the, into the bush, you know, mm. with our dogs, you know, catch animals, rabbits, mm. even bigger animals, bring them home for food. We'd go out there to pick mushroom, uh, bring it back for our parents to cook. How old were you when you were doing all those activities? I think we started early, you mm. know, from seven to eight, you have to go out there and do your job. Mm. Yeah, so by nine, nine years old, we were all busy doing uh, our chores. Um, and then uh, my mother comes from a, a fishing family where they used to do a lot of fishing. So uh, over the weekends, we'd go there and get ourselves involved in fishing. And um, we learned values there. The values basically were, you know, how you relate to the elderly people, the respect that you accord them. And uh, unfortunately, we're living during a time when that is not very uh, common now. Yeah. Kids just grow up thinking that your parents are just your buddies, mm. which is okay. But I think that um, that thing that was inculcated in us, yeah. um, in as far as um, respect, you know, first of all, self-respect, but also to respect those who are older than you. Even if someone is one year older than you, mm. they will remind you, uh, you, yeah. um, you must respect me, you should not call me Mulenga, you should call me Ba Mulenga. Yeah. And if you don't, it's a crisis. You know, you come back with blood on your nose. So, you know, those things trained us to be, um, to honor those that have gone before us and those who have seen more light than we have, according to what they used to say. Um, yeah, so I grew up just doing what every young African boy does in the village. Uh, we went out there to catch birds, would make the little stick and put the gum there, which yeah. we used to make, and mm -hmm. stick it out in the tree. <laughs> a bird comes, yeah. gets on it, we yeah. go there, get it, and we we'll stay there the whole day. Mm. Go back home with 23 birds, and, you know, your mother is very proud of you. So I think that uh, I've said all this to describe the fact that Devas Mumba is not this, you know, Dallas-trained guy who comes out there with some American accent. Absolutely not. Uh -huh. I come from the Bundus. Um, yeah. And the values, if I do have any, uh, were inculcated within me uh, from my early days. It's mm. not, I didn't learn these things from America. I didn't learn them from Hillcrest per se. I learned this amongst my own people. I learned it in my home with my father and my mother. Mm. Um, the values of prayer, the values of Bible reading, uh, those were inculcated in me at home because both my parents were very committed uh, to God. So, yeah, I, I treasure my beginnings mm. and I owe whatever I am today wow. uh, to my great parents who did an excellent job. I love that. I love the fact that you love, you know, and you're proud of where you're coming from. Mm -hmm. Now let's talk about your beautiful wife. I, I, I always like to say that uh, men of your caliber always have, you know, these women that stand by them, that are strong, that are brave, that are courageous. There's a yes. factory where we get them from. <laughs> I like that. Yes. And I hope the young men out there are watching so that they can also go to the same factory. Factory, yes. yes. So how did you meet your lovely wife, Madam Florence? Yeah, um, after I finished with um, uh, secondary school, um, I eventually settled on the copper belt yeah. uh, in Kitwa to be um, specific. And... Um, started to attend the uh, Maranatha Assembly of God Church. That mm. was my home church. I was only 19 years old when I was made the elder uh, of um, Maranatha Church. Mm. Um, I was the worship leader and preached uh, to, to the youth because I was also the director for the youth. Uh, so every Saturday I did that. Um, I've said that to say this, that it was from my church experience yeah. um, that I met Florence, my wife. Mm. She also attended Maranatha Assemblies of, of God mm. Church. She was in my youth group. Mm. Um, and um, at that time, the way we were brought up as um, Christian Pentecostal young people, um, it was very different. Our theology was really crazy. You, 
we didn't watch television, we didn't mm. read the newspapers, all those things were there was worldly. No WhatsApp, no Facebook. No, all time. those things were considered worldly, yeah. you know. You don't watch mm. television, that's the devil's box. And so we spent most of our time praying, you know, studying the Bible mm. in youth camps and all that. Um, and, and the last thing you were expected to be seen doing is to be working with a sister in the Lord, mm. you know. Um, and you don't touch her hand, you know, that is really a taboo. So, uh, Despite so, all the emotions that you were feeling? Yeah, you gotta, you, you gotta subject them to the cross. <laughs> <laughs> you better subject your feelings to the cross. Yeah. And um, so we grew up... Um, with that kind of uh, lifestyle and so it was not easy to just walk over to a sister in the Lord and ask her that uh, I love you and mm. I want us to do some stuff moving yeah. forward. Yeah. yeah, but one day um, our youth group was taking a, a, a sponsored walk from Kito to Kalulushi trying to raise money for the church and um, and uh, she, my wife got really, well Florence at mm. that time got really exhausted and uh, she couldn't move forward and stuff like that. So um, uh, I went over there as the leader mm. and tried to find out what's going on with her. With no intentions? Absolutely no I intentions. Mm -hmm. I was just a spiritual guy trying to be holy and help this sister, you know, and move on. And um, yeah, so um, she couldn't, she said, no, I never, let me sit down and rest. And I said, no, no, we gotta go. You know, you've got on that sheet of paper, promised people that you are going to walk and then get that money. You know, mm. the Lord will not be proud of you if you don't walk because yeah. you get that money fraudulently. So anyway, so I held her to walk with her for some time. And um, yeah, that holding was uh, divine. And uh, it ended up with what I got now. Uh. So they, to cut the long story short, you know, that's how I courted my wife. She came from my youth group. And um, obviously somebody challenged me, how could you take advantage of a girl who was in your, in your group? She was 15 at the time, I believe. Uh, no, uh, 15 or 16. She was very young. Mm. Yeah. Uh, then, um, you know, so that's how come I got from uh, my own garden <laughs> um, uh, woman. So, yeah, that's how we... Um, we met, and uh, from there, I went to Bible College uh, mm. in Dallas, Texas. And um, but at that time, although we met, we walked together. Uh, there was no intention of marriage. Mm. We never even talked about being in a relationship. Were you in a relationship at the time? Uh, no. Mm. Uh, later on, I, I thought I was uh, in a relationship, but this girl didn't think we were. But I thought we were, so I was it. Mm. Um, but but to to explain it well, that time I walked with her. It's what ha whatever happened happened to me, not to her. So, and I didn't say that I loved her. I didn't say that I wanted to you know to reach out to her for marriage or for a relationship. I didn't. So I just left it there. I went to Bible College in Dallas, and. Um, you know, I was praying there one day and then uh, tried to keep contact with as many as I could. But I tried to uh, keep contact with Florence um, when, you know, through a series of events, um, you know, I asked a friend to talk to her about what she felt and um, she responded uh, very badly, you know, like, you know, I, for me marrying a pastor, mm. no, you know, just... Um, tell him I'll be praying for him that the Lord will give him the wife that he deserves. So then I went into 14 day of prayer and fasting in Dallas, you know, for her. For her. And mm. uh, I said, Lord, but I thought you told me this is my wife, you know. And I prayed and I th after 14 days of prayer and fasting, she sent a cassette. You know, those days we were sending a, a voice cassette. You mm -hmm. speak into the cassette. And then send it. It. Mm. it took about a month to get to Dallas, but you know, it was worth the wait. So, um, it came and then she said, you know, the Lord spoke to me that uh, you shall be my husband. Now that was after I had given up, but I kept praying and fasting for her for 14 days. And that was after fasting mm. that that message came. So obviously um, we have a tremendous history together. The Lord has blessed us with five children, now with five grandchildren. Mm. And um, I cannot, I cannot boast of what I've become. Mm without giving 75% of that success to Florence. 
She's a strong woman. She loves God. She's a great teacher of the word. She's a great discipl disciplinarian for her children. I mean, the other day we were laughing. Mm. Um, sometimes we would travel to the U.S., all of us, with the kids when they were very young. And um, all the way from here to the U.S., the kids sat down. Mm. Uh, those ladies who serve on the plane would come and ask, I said, are these children no more? Uh, yeah. But they knew what was good for them. Yeah. That if they mess up, you know, their mother is not going to take it kindly. So who's a disciplinary between you and her? She, her? she is. Okay, she you're is. the softer one. Unfortunately, <laughs> yes. I, it should be the other way around. Uh. But um, uh, she is uh, firm on them. And uh, But now when we look back, you know, I can only salute her for mm. the job she has done. She gives me a lot of credit for them, but I do not think that's a fair thing. Mm. She was tough. They all love the Lord. Um, they're doing well for themselves. And um, it's a pride to be with them in public because they don't display, you know, the kind of attitude of disrespect or, uh, and all that. So, she, yeah, that's what has become of our relationship. Wow. And I'm very thankful to God that uh, he landed me with a woman that did not take away, but added to what I am. That's so powerful. Mm. Now, you are um, among Zambia's first tele-evangelists. I mean, we cannot talk about Zambia Shall Be Saved, a program that was started by you without mentioning your name. Mm. You trained and, uh, you know, coached over 200 ministers of the gospel. Mm. went ahead to set up over a hundred churches across the country. Take us through that life. What was it like? Yeah, well, um, like I said, um, I got uh, into the ministry at a very early age. I gave my life to Christ uh, in, in 1977 mm. at Hillcrest Secondary School. Now, there was a great revival there. There was a, a preacher from West Indies, uh, Winston Brooms, who came and really set the place afire. Um, I gave my life to Christ at that time. Uh, and obviously, um, you know, from that moment on, I decided that I was going to serve the Lord. Although a lot of my friends thought I was going to be in the army mm. because I was the leader of the cadet force in, in Southern Province. I was the regimental sergeant major. So they thought that I was going to become a soldier. Mm. Uh, but um, I ended up being a preacher. Uh, after uh, my time at uh, Hillcrest, I went to Christ for the Nations uh, to Bible school uh, in 1982. Uh, and I was there and graduated in 1984, um, then came back to Zambia and uh, started my crusades across the country. And um, yeah, I was the youngest and the only Zambian having those crusades. Mm. Um, and then after that, uh, I felt very strongly that uh, I needed to start a Bible college to, to, to sort of multiply the gift that uh, was in me. Because at that time, in the, same, in the Pentecostal movement, um, there were not no indigenous Bible colleges. You know, you have a Bible college for the Assemblies of God, which is run by Canadian missionaries and American missionaries. Uh, you, all the Bible colleges were run by missionaries. Our Bible college was in our fraternity as the Pentecostals. Um, it was the, only, the first native Bible college started by Zambian. Uh, and so the Victory Bible College uh, started in Kitwe. And that's when I started to train young men and women. Um, we brought them from all across the country and uh, trained them there and sent them out. Uh, uh, and they're the ones who actually started the churches you're referring to, the mm. more than 100 churches, mm. because I was not necessarily in church planting. Yeah. Because if I'd gone in that direction, I would not have enjoyed the cooperation of pastors mm. uh, in the different towns when I visited it for a crusade. Because when I went for a crusade, pastors came together and created a committee and hosted me. So if they thought I was going there to, to, to steal their members, they mm. would not have cooperated. So I didn't necessarily start the churches, but our graduates started the churches and affiliated them to Victory um, Ministries. And uh, yes, um, and so after starting the churches, after starting the Bible College, um, then I started to pastor, of course, something I didn't think was my calling, mm. but... 
you know, I pastored uh, for several years. And during that time, I had only 1,000. I say only because of what I'm going to say. I had only 1,700 members in the church at that time in Kitwe. And it was basically the largest, you know, a Pentecostal church um, in Kitwe at that point. Um, but I just felt that Zambia was bigger than Kitwe. And the, the phenomenal move of God that I, we were experiencing is unexplainable. It was nothing of me. It, it, it's, it's, it doesn't matter what the complication was. God mm. did it. You know, if someone was blind and we prayed, their eyes opened. And so it was like a, a momentum of revival mm. that my home at some point looked like a hospital. You yeah. know, like in the village when you know there's a witch, uh, uh, what do you call them, um, uh, uh, witch doctor or something mm -hmm. who fixes people. Mm -hmm. People go there with their chickens and hoping. Some people thought that's what I was. So people who come from Congo, you know, come and camp in Kitwe. They'll arrive at the police station and say, we have heard of this nervous Mumba, where can we find him? Yeah. And um, the police will bring them and they'll stay around my house. But we had a Bible college. So we took all these people to the Bible college um, and all that. So in the midst of that movement of God doing great things, and um, it was like relieving the book of Acts. Mm. You know, what was happening in the book of Acts now happening, you know. Um, the sick are being healed. People are being filled with the Holy Spirit. Um, people are giving their lives to Christ in huge numbers. Uh, bars are complaining that the patronage has reduced, mm. you know. <laughs> that kind yeah. of activity in Kitwe mm. was um, not uh, um, uh, abnormal. So I felt that this experience needed to be... Um, shared with the rest of the country. That's when I decided to attempt to get on television. Mm -hmm. Now, you must understand, there was no history of anybody from my background getting on television yeah. with the gospel. Mm -hmm. uh, at least the Zambian. The last one who was there before I got there was Jimmy Swaggart. He was the only one on ZNBC who came once in a while. Yeah. So there was no history of any Christian in Zambia having a television broadcast. So I came to Lusaka, I still remember that day. Um, uh, Frank Mutuwila was the, op uh, I don't know what they called him, you know, operations manager or something. And I walked up into his office and I said, I want to be on television. He said, what do you mean be on television? I said, I want to preach every week on TV. Yeah. So he laughed, because he's my cousin. Mm -hmm. So he fell backwards in the seat, he said, you <laughs> preaching. First of all, neighbors, with all due respect, you can never afford it. It's, it's astronomical, yeah. and um, you preachers don't have money. And then he showed me the charge list, and it was he was correct. Yeah. I mean, I didn't have that kind of money. But I insisted. I said to him, God told me to get on television. He said, Nevers, you can't. You have no money. I said, well, try me. So he said, how do I try you? I said, okay. He said, give me the money. I said, I can't run away. I'm a Zambian, you know I can't run away. I'll yeah. give you money. Money is the list of my problems. Mm. Are you agreed that I get on television? He said, sure, but you have to pay. I said, just do me one little favor. I want to, um, I don't know the word to use. I, I want to, you to give me ZNBC for one day. Yeah. He said, what do you mean? I said, I want to have a telethon. I want to tell the Zambians what I want to do. Mm. And those who believe what I'm saying are going to support me. He's, they had not heard of anything called telethon. Yeah. But because I was in Dallas in Bible school, I knew what that was. Telethon is to share your vision so that people can financially support the television program at that time. So I, uh, for some reason, which I can't explain, they took the risk. And when they all met at ZNBC, they said, no, we can't give one person 12 hours of television. Yeah. What if he messes up? This is, this is a sensitive inst you know, institution. He might say something that you know, put the country on fire. So they gave me uh, six hours from six in the morning to, tw I don't know, from 12 to 6 p.m. So, which means that my team mm -hmm. was in charge of ZNBC for six hours. We did our own programming, and because I already had experience in television in Dallas, yeah. I, we planned it to the second. We did a better job than Z, ZNBC. 
They couldn't believe our transitions. They couldn't believe the fact that we planned it to the second. Yeah. You know, so it is there that I faced the camera and I told the Zambian people that I believe that Zambia shall be saved. But in order for this to happen, I need your support. We want to start a television broadcast for the next 13 weeks. And I need for you to give money so that we can pay ZNBC for my programs, as basic as that. Mm. And I brought different people, interviewed them, and it was a great six hours. By the end of the five hours, people were walking and driving to ZNBC with checks in their hands. Before we left the studio, I signed a check for ZNBC for 13 weeks and still had change left over from that telethon. That's how the Zambia Shall Be Safe television broadcast began. Mm. So when I look back, it's, there's nothing that has happened with me that was easy. But I trusted that if God has called me to do it, mm. it doesn't matter how complicated it is, it's going to happen. Mm. So I, um, I'm a man of possibilities because of God. Wow. Not because of Chinsali, but because of God. I love that. Now, you talk about Zambia shall be saved with so much passion. Mm -hmm. what, what happened? What, what, what became different after Zambia shall be saved? Well, what look, changed? A lot has changed. Mm. You know, when I look back, um, this is not the Zambia we used to have. Mm. Um, you know, there are those that have been born in the interim. But Zambia was not like this. I'll give you an example from the church point of view. When I was a young person in Kitwe, to walk with a Bible in town, you were embarrassed because you didn't want people to know you were a Christian. So we used to have little Gideon Bibles. They were red in color. The pocket Bibles. The pocket Bibles. Because oh. we didn't want anybody to laugh at us, you know, all these uh, holier-than-thou guys and stuff like that. Through the years, it's actually more fashionable to walk with a big Bible in, and people respect you and honor you. That did not come by chance. But it was through the labor of God's people, preaching the gospel and making Zambia the Christian nation that it is today. And it has not been an easy road. And today you have churches at every corner of Zambia. It was not like that. You know, uh, when I started, there was only the Catholic Church. There was the Assemblies of God, the Baptist Church, the Methodist Church, the mainline churches, the big churches. But there were no these you know, mm. the churches you call uh, Light Ministries, mm -hmm. Bread of Life Ministries, Is that a good Victor thing, Ministries. Is that for us? The, the, the ministries. Yeah, the small little churches. Yes, that. because the churches mm. in the New Testament were home sales. Mm. You know, just groupings of people that got together to, to, to worship God. That's how the church grew. It didn't grow from one just big church organization. It, it was 12 disciples there. The, the persecution came. They scattered into Samaria. There they, they started small groups. From there they went beyond Jerusalem, Samaria. Then they went to the outermost part of the world. So they started to spread like a wildfire. And the, the, the Christianity you see in Zambia mm. is as a result of even the small churches they used to call you know, classroom churches, you know, because we couldn't build churches. Mm. We had no money, but we had God. We had the spirit. We were able to preach. So that's how the church grew in Zambia. To cut a long story short, my vision for Zambia Shall Be Saved was consummated in, I'd, I'd, I'd already been calling my crusade Zambia Shall Be Saved crusades, mm. but we had one Zambia Shall Be Saved crusade in Mongu in the stadium, um, and I had an experience there. And that experience was, there was a lady that came for prayer. I was preaching for 14 nights, mm. um, every night in the stadium. And there was a woman who was 61 years old. She was sick, thin, poor, and hardly clothed. And she almost looked insane. She came to the crusade. I prayed for her. She gave her life to Christ. I prayed for her. She received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I prayed for her, and she got healed from her sickness. Within five days, she was a totally transformed woman. And she sat with me on the platform. We gave her new clothes. She was worshiping God with her, totally transformed from what she was. One night, I was sleeping, and I heard the voice of God ask me about that woman when I was still in the crusade. Do you remember that woman? And her face came to me. I said, yes, Lord, I remember that woman. He said, what happened to that woman? I said, this woman was changed. She is transformed. She's new. Yeah. Then God spoke to me in my heart to say, I want you to take this same power 
that has changed that woman from a wreck that she was to the saint that she is now. I want you to take that power that changed her and apply it to your nation. The same God who has transformed this woman can transform your nation if only you can believe me. The Zambia shall be saved dream goes to the extent that it doesn't matter how broken this country is. If we can trust God, if God can save you as an individual, mm. if he can heal your body as, as an individual, he can also save a nation, he can also heal a nation. And I look back today, I never thought there would come a day when somebody would say, Zambia now is declared a Christian nation. Based on what? Even if President Chiluva didn't say that, Zambia was already a Christian nation by practice. Mm. He only called it what it were, already was uh, because evangelists, preachers, church had done its homework to go around this country and uh, talk about the love of God. So I, I come from that background. And when I say Zambia shall be saved up to this day, mm. whenever I, I scream that, I see a blood-washed nation a nation that bows its knee to the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm. The only thing that is missing now is to ensure that we put more women and men of faith into major decision-making positions so that the declaration is backed up with moral Christian leaders leading a Christian nation. We are not there yet. Uh, we can, um, you know, corrupt people trying to preside over a Christian nation. They create a paralysis. Mm. So that's where we are going uh, with this vision of Zambia shall be saved. We are almost there, and I know that Zambia will become a model on this continent as to what a Christian nation truly looks like, mm. not just by proclamation, but in reality. Wow, I love that. Mm. Now, um, when preparing for this interview, of course, a lot of Zambians out there asked me to ask you, this one question on their behalf. Mm. Why did you leave church and end up in politics? I did, ne I did not leave church. Uh, I've never left church. Still I'm still the leader of mm. Victory Ministries. Uh -huh. I'm still in charge of our churches. Uh -huh. And uh, I am still training our pastors. Uh -huh. uh, we have a summit every year in which we bring in all our leaders. And I personally train them. Uh, during that summit. Even when I was vice president, mm. I was still training my pastors. Because politics is voluntary. It's only now that it has become a profit-making venture. It, it's, it's a community service. Yeah. Always had been from the beginning. Mm. Uh, when the missionaries came, uh, they came as doctors, teachers, um, and on voluntary basis, ran commu you know, took care of the courts, took care of governance, but they were teachers, they were doctors. But now it has become a business, and that's why it has been corrupted, because people become politicians to make money. No, no, politicians, if you want to make money, go into private sector, be a farmer, do those things. If you want to be a politician, you must first of all put voluntarism first, if they give you uh, some kind of money to carry out what you're doing, it's on top of what you're doing. But it's not supposed to be a business. So I never moved from church. Mm. Um, I preach. Um, but the same God who called me to preach is the same God who gave me the burden to get Zambia saved. For me, the way other people see it is not the way I see it. God called me to preach to you, Mwangala. Mm. If you are not a Christian, and I find you, in, you know, living a life that is just, let's not talk about it. Then I preach Christ to you. Yeah. And you accept him in your heart. And your life changes. Whatever you were, you're no longer that. You've now accepted Christ as your savior. The transformed Mwangala, mm -hmm. her life is an example now. She has a home, she has a family, she has children, she's responsible, and she's growing a community. Okay? It's the same God who now is going to save Zambia, the same way Mwangala was saved. Yeah. So Zambia can be transformed where this faith can become the bedrock of this nation. That our decisions in parliament, our decisions in the executive, our judgments in our courts of law are going to be embedded within the values of God's word. That's when you call Zambia is saved. Because now, as the judge sits there, 
to make judgment. He's fully aware. He sits there on the behalf of God. Yeah. If somebody gives him money to pervert justice mm. because of the infusion of the fear of God, he will not touch it. So he will meet out equitable judgment, both to the poor and to the rich. That's where we are going with this Zambia shall be saved dream. They will sit in cabinet and make a decision not based on their selfish desires, but on what is in the interest of the Zambian people because they, they fear God. I'll give you an example. Having been vice president of this country, I acted as president several times. Mm. One of those particular times, President Mwanawasa was out of the country and he instructed me to deal with a certain subject. The subject was we were planning on getting new VXs or vehicles for the ministers and all that. And there was a pro problem with the under five funding of the medicines for the under five mm. uh, children. To, you know, to avoid a certain, I don't remember what problem that was. Mm -hmm. In order to save life, you have to save them within that five-year period by in inoculations and stuff. But we had no money for it, okay? So when I was chairing that meeting, there was a serious debate in cabinet. The ministers, a lot of them wanted those vehicles, you know, uh, started to get imported. I sat in that seat as acting president. I had to make a decision whether the money we were debating on the table should go to the vehicles or it should go to the under five children. I made a decision it's going to go to the under five children. There was a reaction from cabinet. But we went ahead and did that. The point I'm trying to make here is that if you are moral and you sit in a seat of decision making, you do it in the interest of other people. Yeah. It is also true that somebody could have made a decision that we buy the vehicles. And Zambians would not have known there was that problem and competition and decision. Mm -hmm. And this is why it is important to make sure that those who seek high office have an experience with God, a fear for God, a justice embedded within them. It's the same thing with Parliament. That if you have people who fear God there and legislation has to be made, uh, on anything. For instance, we are moving towards a time when nations have to decide what to do with homosexuality. Other parliaments have already confronted that. Mm. Our Zambian parliament has not yet really dealt with it in its current form. They will have to make a decision because the human rights groups believe that you should not stop homosexuals from exercising yeah. their, 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 their freedom. Mm. Mm. So what do you do as a speaker of the National Assembly? What do you do as a member of parliament? Um, these are decisions that have to be made by a moral people. And some of the decisions, I'll give you an example. In South Africa, just this last week, I think, they passed a law that waters down adultery. It's no longer an issue because they say that if you go and commit sexual sin with another man's wife, mm. she has agreed and he has agreed. So why should you punish someone to pay him, to pay the husband? He was not even there when you're transacting. Mm, mm. So they decided that you know, the law would not get involved. It's a domestic problem. Mm, you did it. You yeah, did it. That that never, yeah. Now that's a terrible thing when we look at our tradition. It just doesn't happen. But it has passed. Now, here is the truth. The, the chief justice of South Africa is a born again preacher like Nevis Mumba. He's a friend of mine. So last night, I contacted him. I said to him, my brother, mm. how can you play with the law like that? Now you guys are saying that adultery is no longer an issue. Then he said to me, brother Nevis, our problem on the continent and in the world, it's not us judges, it's the constitutions. A judge does not write a constitution. Mm. A judge interprets the law. My constitution in South Africa stipulates that you cannot do what we were doing, punishing somebody for something he has not done because of someone's cons consensual act. And he said, what we need to start doing is to do constitutions that have embedded God's values. And so... I have said all this to say that Zambia shall be saved 
means that the very values of God are embedded in the executive, in the judiciary, in parliament, so that when we're making decisions for our people, they are moral decisions, just decisions, and equitable decisions. That can never happen if you just put criminals in power. They will never even think about what I've talked about. This is what my fight for my country is. This is what I live for. When you say Nevers Mumba is doing politics, I have no business doing politics. Mm. This is my vision. This is my call. This is what I fight for. Call me a politician all you want because you can't find another name to call me mm. because everybody's called a politician. But my vision is to bring this country to the recognition that Jesus Christ is Lord and our community can be equitable if all of us did our part. That's powerful. How do you strike a balance between being a pastor, being a, a husband, and a politician? Allow me to still call you a politician, unless you give me another name. No, for there's me. no other name for now. They won't understand it. Okay. Community yeah. worker. A community you know? worker, yeah. yeah. So I'm yeah. going to address you as a community worker. How do you strike a balance between being a father? First of all, mm -hmm. I'm encouraged by the scripture which says I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Uh -huh. So because of that scripture, I'm able to do that. Well. The balancing act is very, very tough. Um, you know, you, you, we call it uh, opportunity cost. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes because I'm, I'm a husband, mm -hmm. I'm a politician, I'm a pastor. These are three very challenging issues, but I do other things besides mm -hmm. this. So for church and politics, there is an aspect where the family pays a very high price. Mm -hmm because it's more of a passion. To preach is, it's a passion. It's, yeah. it's some, I love to preach. It's a call that drives me. So I would be away from home for months. I used to go for three months, touring the United States, Europe, then I come back. And my wife has to look after the children all by herself. So to that extent, there was a price to my family. I would be in crusades. My crusades were 14 days each mm. in different cities of Zambia. And all that time, I would be away from home. My children are growing without a father. So there is that opportunity cost uh, to what I was doing. The same with politics. Um, you know, I wish it was easy that, um, you know, I, I could be with my family and do politics. But mostly I'm out trying to either raise money for politics or campaign in politics. In two days' time, I'm leaving for Lukasha. I'll be there until the election. So those are things that we all do as men. Yeah. But I think through the years, I've learned how to juggle. And, and just strike a balance. Yeah, strike a balance. It's mm -hmm. like when you cut, your leg is cut. You know, you don't know what to do. But after a while, you adapt and know how to get on without one leg. Mm -hmm. And I think that I'm in a place where I'm very happy preaching. I'm, I'm very happy uh, counseling. Mm -hmm. I'm very happy doing politics. I'm very happy uh, being a father. I'm very happy being a husband. Wow, I love that. Yeah. What is that one thing that Zambians don't know about you? That I love my wife. <laughs> They don't don't do all that. men do? Well, I, I think because of what I do, uh -huh. and um, my wife is, um, she's not a public person. Uh -huh. She is my engine in the background, uh -huh. and she does not like to, to be, be visible. Uh -huh. No, she just wants to be Nevers Mumba's wife. Um, and she does not want to become the center of attention for anything. Uh -huh. So a lot of people see me uh, in a lot of functions on my own, except for major functions or family functions, mm. uh, maybe a wedding or you know, whatever is social, uh, I'm with her. But high-level political activity, no. When um, you know, I was vice president, yes, I would go to parliament for the opening of parliament should be there. I uh, would have um, independent celebration should be there because it's required of her. Uh, but um, so because of that, some people think, in fact, at one time, people were thinking Nevers and, uh, and his wife are divorced. You said yeah. all that story that went wrong. Yeah, they are divorced, you know. <laughs> they said Nevers is married to a black American. She has gone back to the United States. And my wife is from Kawambu. <laughs> and, uh, but all these things go out there because people don't, no, yeah. I don't expose my wife to, to I am called to politics. Yeah. Uh, she's called to support me, and uh, she plays within her limits, and uh, I love her dearly. She's, I mean, if I were to get married again, I'll get her again. Mm. 
She's an amazing woman. Uh, she's given me five beautiful children. She stood by my side, whether I'm in jail or I'm out of jail. Uh, whether I'm um, broke or I've got some money. Mm. She's not one of those who is petty. Uh, she stands solidly with me, and I love her with all my heart. And I want the Zambians to know that. Wow. If you had to describe yourself using one word, what would that word be? Crazy. <laughs> <laughs> crazy? Are you crazy? Yeah, because that's what people think. Uh -huh. I see why you were doing so well according to them as a pastor, the yes, leading evangelist that's in this country. That's what everybody thinks. The, living, the only guy on television, the only guy holding the biggest conference in the nation amongst the Pentecostals, he, the guy f flying around the world as a big speaker in major conferences around the world, then all of a sudden you want to go into this dirty politics. Is it dirty? That's what they call it. Mm -hmm. but uh, it is it, dirty. That's is why that I went how you there. Look at it? Yes, that's mm -hmm. why I went there. I go to dirty things, mm -hmm. you know. And if, clean them up. Yeah, to clean them up. Mm -hmm. And that's my calling, you know. And this is the misunderstanding people have. The meaning of evangelist mm -hmm. is to go where evangelism is needed. Evangelism is needed amongst people who are heathen. They don't know God. Mm -hmm. They don't know Christ. Your job is to introduce Christ and evangelize those people. So it, it's exactly the same going into politics. I had to look around and say, which is the dirtiest area of society? And I was convinced the dirtiest and the darkest was politics. And if I'm the light of the world, mm. then that's where I belong in order to bring the light in the darkest place. That's why there's so much fight against anyone with light going into politics. I don't care who it is, whether it's Moses, whether it's Joshua, whether it's Joseph, it doesn't matter who it is. The moment light goes into governance, they'll fight it. Moses was almost killed. Mm. He became a wanted criminal in Egypt because he was shining the light to deliver a people. And I want to say this, that politics is dirty, but it has been made dirty by those who are handling it. The only way to make it clean is to let people with clean hands hold politics. And until Zambia does that, politics will continue to be called dirty, will continue to be an avenue to corrupt uh, the, the, the wealth of the citizens and to take away the future of our children. So I'm in politics because I'm needed there. Just like many other believers, they are needed in this field. And I'm calling on many, many men and women of God to come into this field and make it what God wants us to be until we can all say, so, we can all say Zambia shall be saved. Wow. If you were on your deathbed and you were given a second chance to live, what would you do differently? I would preach the gospel and I would do politics. <laughs> like if that. I were to do it again. Uh. Yeah. Okay. If you were to become president, what is that one thing that you would do differently? Now, I know there are so many things that you'd want to do, but what is that one thing that keeps you awake in the night? I think that it is to change the system of government by ensuring that we create rules or constitutional provisions that are followed by citizens so that we create a working society. Zambia does not work now. Um, that's why young people can't stand being in Zambia. When they get a little education, they go to America. It's not that America is better than us. It's just that they have a working system. If you have a dif difference with somebody, you go to court, justice is given fairly. Uh, you are you're over speeding, they arrest you, there's a fee to pay, it doesn't go to the policeman, it goes to the station. People like order, they like systems. If you work hard, you get a degree, you get a job. Not a criminal, a son of a minister who has never been to school getting the job without any qualifications. We wa I want to create a working system so that people start to come to Zambia to be able to develop, to grow, because there's no sustainable growth without a working system. The police doesn't work in Zambia. 
the judicial system is not working in Zambia. The law, the parliament is not working because the laws that are being made, they are totally partisan because of numbers. It has nothing to do with what the Zambians want. So my vision is that the first term in office, I'll make sure that we have a working system, that whether you are president or a street sweeper, if you break the law, the law will be fairly and equitably applied. And once that starts to happen, and you can see, in Zamb when you go to the United States, you go into the supermarket in Walmart, for instance, and line up to pay. You wait there until your turn to pay comes. Because there's, within their system, order, a desire for order. You go to ShopRite in Zambia, they line up. Uh, some, I was in Kasama. This one just comes and jumps in the line. When the other said, you are not so you say, and inche, and inche. Mm -hmm. and So there's mm. this inbuilt lack of discipline and respect for, rule, uh, for the rule of law. I would like to bring the rule of law back. It's the foundation upon which you can build a working society. Otherwise, you'll be getting debt money, get, throw it on a disorganized system. you never develop. That's why we have sucked in so many billions of dollars, and we are the same. Because our systems don't work. I shall make the systems of Zambia work. Because I believe it's only on the rails of working systems that development can be seen, prosperity can be noticed, and becoming a first world only becomes possible if you have a working system. I love that. Now, the objective of our show is to bring out the best in people's lives. It's to ignite something that, you know, is within, yet they don't know that there's some, they have something special within. What is your message to the many Zambians that are watching us today? Well, you've listened to my story. I think my story is a classic or, or a classic Zambian story. Um, that it does not matter what your background is, whether you grew up in Chinsari like myself, or in Mongu, uh, like my colleagues, uh, or in um, Choma, or in Solwezi. It doesn't matter your background, whether you went to Chiwala uh, Secondary School or you went to Hillcrest Secondary School, whether you went to Divala or whichever place you went to. It doesn't matter what your background is. What really awaits you is a great future. If you can believe in the fact that God created you to succeed, and all the things you have faced are not an indication that you are not going to make it. As a matter of fact, the challenges you face are an indication you have a destiny which is greater than you have ever imagined. So don't give up when you find challenges along the way. Anybody that has become somebody has had to cry red tears because of saying, why me? I can say, don't judge your future by someone, someone's history. You have a bright future. People who have made it are just like you. They have got the same color of blood like you. You are even more handsome than most of them, but they have made it. So don't give up on yourself. You can become anything and everything that you have ever dreamt of becoming from a poor man in Chinsali chasing after rabbits and animals and killing little, you know, killing little birds on that, on that gum stick. I came all the way and became vice president of the Republic of Zambia. You can do more than that. And God is waiting for you to believe in yourself. Wow, I, 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 I have been ignited. <laughs> well, thank I'm, you. I'm sure it has done that for you. Well, it I... took you back to the heyday. Yeah, yeah. To talk about, you know, how you became the vice president of this country and now yes. going on to becoming the president of the yes. MMD. Yeah. Good luck. Thank All you so best. much. And I'd like to say, see you at the top. Thank you very much. <laughs> I hope, you know, that's a prophecy. I get it and I throw it out there and God is going to make use of it. Thank you so much. Thank you. So there you have it. I was talking to the president of the MMD, Dr. Nevas Sequila Mumba. Now, the Zambians asked for us to talk to him and Ignite brought you Dr. Nevas Mumba. This has been Mwangala Chakalashi Santos on Ignite with Mwangala. Join me for another exciting episode. <laughs>